119 Nocturne Boulevard presents The Dunwich Horror by H.P. Lovecraft Adapted by Julie Overson When a traveler in North Central Massachusetts takes the wrong fork at the junction of Aylesbury Pike, just beyond Dean's Corners, he comes upon a lonely and curious country. One dreads to trust the tenebrous tunnel of the bridge, yet there is no way to avoid it. With Dave Marshall as Dr. Henry Armitage. Once across, it is hard to prevent the impression of a faint, malign odor about the village street, as of the masked mold and decay of centuries. Glenn Hallstrom as Professor Warren Rice. It is always a relief to get clear of the place and to follow the narrow road down the base of the hills and across the level country beyond until it rejoins the Aylesbury Pike. Lothar Tuppen as Dr. Francis Morgan. Afterwards, one sometimes learns that one has been through Dunwich. And Danner Hoverson as Wilbur Waitley. Outsiders visit Dunwich as seldom as possible, and since a certain season of horror, all the signboards pointing towards it have been taken down. Part two of four. I wonder how I shall look when the earth is cleared and there are no earth beings on it. He that came with the Aklaus of Alf said I may be transfigured, there being much of outside to work on. Hurry him up, it's a long drive. Yes, yes. I only just knocked. <laughs> Sorry. What? Mrs. Armitage, Henry told us to call around and pick him up for a drive. Dr. Harwell is in with him. Doctor, is he all right? I'm fine. Be out in a minute. <laughs> no regard to what I want. I'm very sorry. If anything is distressing you, I'm certain it's not the professor's intention. He made his will last night. Oh, I don't approve any more than Martha does. I am a grown man, Hartwell, and I can make my own choices. I asked you here as a courtesy, since I'll have to be out of town for several days. <laughs> Armitage had spent a good deal of time deciphering Wilbur's manuscript, enough time to give him about a brain fever that he was only just recovering from. I... I don't know what to say. Tell me the auto is ready. Can you get my bag? And the box there? Of course. Armitage, are you sure you're up to this? I feel fine. Even Hartwell couldn't find any reason to forbid me a, a nice relaxing drive into the country. Could you? You've made a quick recovery from the brain fever, but there is always the possibility of relapse. You'll need more rest, Henry. I can rest in the back of Morgan's Model T as well as I can rest on my own front porch. And getting out of the city for a few days will give me all the fresh air I can stomach. You could at least bid Martha farewell. She is your wife. She knows how I feel. Well, that was a bit harsh. We've said all there was to be said. Neither she nor I could face another confrontation. I doubt I should be able to hold to my resolve. Shot Elam Hutchins called Jack when he went to bite me. And Elam says he would kill me if he dast. I guess he won't. Aha. City limits. Now, we enter the hinterlands. We're still on the main roads. It's not hinterland until we're on dirt. Is he napping? No, he's not. He's just resting his eyes. <laughs> Sorry. 
You said you would tell us some more. Keep us all entertained while we made this little excursion? I hate to rein in the exuberance of youth, but I don't somehow think you're taking all this quite seriously enough, Morgan. Just because I look at it as a bit of an adventure doesn't mean I won't be in at the pinch. I just don't see why we need to go about it with mournful faces. I appreciate the light mood, Morgan. We'll have plenty of time for long faces later, I've no doubt. Then tell us more about Wheatley. If what we're thinking we might face is something he left brewing back home, the more we understand him, the more we can understand it. What evening, just as twilight fell, Armitage finished his terrible perusal and sank back exhausted. His wife, bringing his dinner, found him in a half-comatose state, but he was conscious enough to ward her off with a sharp cry when he saw her eyes wander towards the notes he had taken. I have something funny about Waitley. What? What? In the papers today. Here. It was the name Dunwich that caught my eye. It's, it's not much, but it mentioned how in Dunwich the old Waitley farmhouse must have been used for illegal purposes. The paper cites a bootlegging still as it, get this, blew up last night. Blew up? It doesn't go into any detail, but the article is titled, Alcohol and Amateurs, a Volatile Mix. Volatile? But somehow I think bootlegging is not what we shall find when we get there. See, I can be just as serious as you. I'm sure you have the right of it, but it is definitely good to be forewarned about potential dangers. The article says the house was destroyed, but oddly enough, it does not mention fire, which we would expect from a normal explosion. I wondered if you would catch that. And this was in today's paper? The actual incident was several days ago. It may mean we'll find more of such devastation when we reach the town. I brought all the precautionary material you wanted. The powders, the incantations. And I brought a big game rifle. A what? A very large, very intimidating gun. Whether we're dealing with locals or monsters or even elephants, I can at least wave it and look menacing. (laughs) Actually, for locals, I brought something even better. What? (laughs) You'll see. I don't like that laugh. (laughs) I know. He had sufficient strength to get home, but was so clearly in need of medical aid that Dr. Hartwell was summoned at once. As the doctor put him to bed, he could only mutter over and over again, But what in God's name can we do? Now that you've brought us up to date on the town, let me fill in some of the details about the Waitleys. Wilbur Waitley was born to one Lavinia Waitley, and though she had no husband, she didn't try to hide her uh, condition. Her father, known locally as Wizard Waitley... He of the black magic bent. Yes. He always insisted she had a husband. Although no one ever saw him. And there was no legal proof of marriage. Many of the locals felt that living all alone as they did, perhaps old Waitley himself was to blame. (laughs) Inbreeding. Of course. But Lavinia was no siren. Past 30, unmarried, and unfortunate in appearance, perhaps she felt this was her only chance. Unfortunate? You mean ugly? Deformed. Albino. You might have mentioned that before. Her appearance was stunning, but her personality was... uh, I I met her briefly when I was in town. She was a very fragile woman. Not fragile physically, perhaps, but there was a strange, unreal quality to her. I do not think she ever had the slightest chance of being happy. Not with a father like that. Stop talking around things. You've already hinted that Wilbur was not entirely human. Since this poor woman sounds all too human, it must have been the child's father who contributed the rest. I'm not talking round. I'm laying a foundation. Oh, cut to the chase. Hill noises. Sacrifices. May Eve. Necronomicon. yogg Morgan! Have I come to the right conclusion? You're very clever. Almost as clever as you think yourself. I doubt it was Yog sartoth himself, for he could not break completely through at that time. But some avatar? Yes. What is this yogg sartoth What does it do? The Necronomicon is not an encyclopedia. It's not a dictionary. Just as the Christian Bible doesn't define in clear and absolute terms what an archangel is... The Necronomicon only alludes to the powers and governances of these entities. But that key passage... Key. (laughs) ...implies that Yogg-Sothoth is one that will let everything else 
in. And now? I think something has been set in motion. A series of events whose culmination is a full summoning. Yog Sothoth knows the gate. Yog Sothoth is the gate. Yog Sothoth is the key and guardian of the gate. Past, present, future, all are one in Yog Sothoth. There's no good side to this, is there? Good side? You know what I mean. Some things are a mixed bag of good and bad. A forest fire seems like a horrible tragedy until you realize the ashes refertilize everything around and new growth can begin. He's still debating the ethics of the Great War. I see your point, but no, there is no good side. Not for humanity. Good. No ambiguity, then. Never hurts to be certain you have the high ground. Whatever Wilbur has set in motion, whatever he was trying to get home in time for, is nothing to waffle about. I'm not exaggerating when I call it potentially the end of the world. Glad to be here with you. What he said. My plan, then, when we get to town, is to speak with the locals at the general store. Osborne's, as I recall. See what we can find out. Then we'll go to the former Waitley farmhouse, sort out what we can from the remains. Grandfather kept me saying the dough formula last night. And I think I saw the inner city at the two magnetic poles. I shall go to those poles when the earth is cleared off. Will the locals be helpful, do you think? You said they didn't like the Waitleys much. Are there any other Waitleys left that we have to worry about? There are Waitleys all over the region, but Wilbur's mother and grandfather have both passed away, I believe. Good. No one to object if we go poking around the old homestead. And the townsfolk? They don't like to talk about these things, but they also never like the Waitleys. We may get somewhere with a cautious application of money. Though large sums will make them suspicious. They don't like city folks much out this way, either. Don't fret. I'll warm them up. Today learned the Aklo for the Sabaoth, which did not like. It being answerable from the hill and not from the air. Good thing Morgan brought an extra can of fuel. What do you suppose he's doing in there? I, I don't know. He seemed very sure of himself. These young fellows, they think they know everything. <laughs> he's only young to us old fellows. Come on in. Goodness. Shall we? These are my friends, Professor Rice and Dr. Armitage. Ah, very pleased. Morgan has told you something of why we're here? Aye, up. Can't say much for your timing. Not with all what's been a-going on. Shush, Amy. I will not shush, Earl Sawyer. If these fellas can fix what's broke here and leave us with our lives, I say all power to them. Tis the end of days. That's what Zeblon's been saying. Says, just close your eyes and hope for a swift passage to land a milk and honey. Silas, I don't want to hear that kind of talk in my place. Mamie here was telling me something about Wilbur's mother. Well, I'm not one for gossip. <clears throat> Earl, I can only speak to what I've seen with my own eyes. I went to pay a call after the birth, bring her some little things that babies can need. Well, no one else was a gunner. She didn't have no woman friends. No friends at all. None of them Waitleys ever did. Would have helped if they'd bothered with church. <laughs> a wizard would have no truck with any proper religion. Him and his old books. Well, when I stopped in on Lavinia, she looked that haggard. And I'd had two children myself, know what that's like. But she... Oh, my... You know she was an albino, do you? Yes, I met her myself when I was in town a few years back. I knew you looked familiar. You remember Silas? No. When the doctor called you flat-footed, said you weren't fit. I'm fitter than any other in this town. Of course you are, Silas. Them city doctors don't know a damn what they're about. I don't think it's the doctors. Hmm. I, I think it's the army don't know a damn. <laughs> <laughs> but then it means we were left alone once they gave us up as a bad job. Can't say we don't want it that way. Might I please finish a single sentence before all your menfolk go off an army blather? Let the woman talk. Maybe she'll run herself tired. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tried to find out a bit about the father and said how everyone was curious what kind of feather he was. 
she wouldn't speak to that, but soon after she came out wandering around the woods. She was always quite a wanderer, was Lavinia, making dead certain everyone had a darn good look at her babe. She was right proud of that little beast. Must been born with hair, that one. I hate to speak ill of the dead. And while there wasn't no proper funeral, everyone knows Lavinia's gone from this world. But she did seem to take it that that baby made her a woman. Being a woman made the baby. Gosh. <laughs> we never took her real serious. Thought of her more as an animal. Something you saw in the woods but never stopped to talk to. Twas like she thought finally doing something normal and expected would make her suddenly normal too. Poor thing. You felt sorry for her? They from the air told me at Sabbath that it will be years before I can clear off the earth. And I guess Grand Sile will be dead then. Can't let this go to waste. I hope you don't mind, Mr. Osborne. I have another bottle or two if you'd like them. For the store. Shan't say no. Them cattle now. That was a mystery. Yeah. Cattle? Old Lately kept buying cows and sheep and sometimes horses and anything he could lay his hands on. Except dogs. <laughs> no, no. They never have a dog up there. Paid for it all in strange old gold coins. We figured he'd come across a treasure somewhere in them hills. Ain't a body like to touch it, but it's spent well as art. So who are we to argue? Do you have any of the coins? Later, Rice. Right. But them cows, they just up and vanished. Really? Interesting. Thank ye. <coughs> and not a body nude, where'd they to gone? The ones that didn't disappear wasn't much better. Ale and I'd call it. Listless and covered in strange sores. Did it? Did they look like a bite or a cut right in the center of a bruise? Uh, yeah. Why do you ask, Mrs. Fry? Thinking back on Lavinny, back when she and baby Wilbur was fussed about. She had some of them same kind of sores. Interesting. <gasps> It's a moving again. Grand Sire don't think of me as nigh what he wanted. He goes on saying as how Ma was flawed. A willing vessel is well and good, but she were too soft, too human. I'll have to work harder to do it right than I ought, and it's all on her. Tell him what you saw, Luther. Something, uh, something was in the rud. Useless lump. Drag him all the way here so's all can hear it. And this is what I get. Sounds like he's in shock. Here. Uh, uh. Now you speak up, boy, or I'll take a belt to you. Up, up there in the road beyond the glen. It smells like thunder, and all the bushes and little trees is pushed back from the rud. Like they'd a house moved along it. That's cold spring glen for them as is wondering. And that ain't the worst neither. There's prints in the road. Great round prints as big as barrel heads. All sunk down deep like an elephant had been along. Only there's a sight more nor four feet can make. <laughs> And the smell, oh, the smell was wicked fierce. Like what it is around Wizard Waitley's old house. It bust. We heard. Would you like... I don't mind if I do. Further shock. We'd like to take a look at what's left of the house. Don't want to go up there. Taint pretty. Oh, Waitley's house? It is all bowed up, with timbers scattered round, like they'd be dynamite inside. Only the bottom floor. Bottom floor ain't through, but it's all covered up with a kind of tar-like stuff that smells foul and drips down onto the ground where the side timbers is blowed away. And a great swath wider than a barn is matted down, and all the stun walls tumbled every which way. And Sally, up to Seth Bishop's, phoned round and told me her boy'd been out looking for the Bishop kind. Up the upper pasture, nigh the Devil's Hop Yard, Chauncey found a good part of Seth's herd. I, I went with when he asked me. In no fit shape they was. Half of them was clean gone, and nigh half of them's left was sucked most dry of blood. With sores on him, like them on Waitley's livestock. Not a one went dead and gone, and that's a blessing. Since neither of us could have lived if we heard them low, and I swear. Was there any sign of where it went? Didn't look careful to see where the big matted down swath led after it left the pasturage. Pointed rough towards the Glen Rudd to the village. 
and the Glen. I tell ye, there's something abroad that hadn't ought to be abroad, and I ain't the only one that thinks that Wilbur Waitley is at the bottom of the breeding of it. He want all human hisself, Alda says to everybody. And I think he and old Waitley must uh, raise something in that there nailed-up house as ain't even so human as he was. There's always been unseen things around Dunwich, living things, as ain't human and ain't good for human folks to make much notice of. I always says Cold Spring Glen ain't no healthy nor decent place. The whippoorwills and fireflies there never did act like they was creatures of God. And they's them as says you can hear strange things are rushing in a talking in the air down there if you stand in the right place. We all went round the first day. In a group. Not one wanted to be near there on their lonesome mind. And had a look at what was left, and at them prints, and followed them to the glen. But don't go thinking we followed them aught further. You have all been very helpful. I fear we must impose one more time for directions to the Waitley house. Now, but it's coming down dark in a couple of hours. You won't get there and back, and ain't no safe place to stop between there and here. We have an automobile. I know the roads will take it. Best to wait till morning. We're quite prepared to deal with this thing, whatever it is. Is there someone who might be able to put us up for the night, perhaps? That upstairs more ahead of me than I had thought it would be and is not like to have much earth brain. We appreciate your being willing to put us up for the night, Mrs. Corey. I've never ridden a motor car before. Even when them was round before, I was too young, Ma said. We're going awful fast, ain't we? Perfectly safe, my good lady. Now that you won't scare all of them loafers, Luthug, you go on and tell them what I told you not to tell in town. I... I don't like to say. These men need to know every odd thing about Wilbur and his ma. You go on now. It was Halloween, some years back. There's a great blaze at midnight on the top of Sentinel Hill. That's where the table rock stands. I was out rounding up a stray heifer. He was curious and feather-headed. You gonna let me speak or you gonna tell it for me? You are doing just fine. I saw a white shape in the woods and thought at first it was a ghost or something. Too stupid to run away. But I realized it was... It was Lavinia Waitley and... And she was... Wasn't wearing a stitch of clothes. Ugly or not, one bare-assed woman is good as another to this sprouting boy. Then I saw Wilbur was with her. Running up the hill right ahead of his mother. This was before the fire, so we later figure they must have lit it. They were so quiet. Like haunts. Like some kind of spirits. Was the boy unclothed as well? To a long past dark in the woods. But I think maybe he had some kind of trousers on. Dark he was from the belt down, and he wrote. And he weren't looking at the boy. Ah. No one ever saw that child without clothes. Never. Even as a babe, Lavinia kept him tight swaddled. Funny, since she never cared much for her own clothes. Always looked like an unmade bed, that one. And her father wasn't much better. Can't stop fretting grandsire's right, and I shan't be good enough. What if the father come and find me lacking as she would bore me? Perhaps I'll be cleansed. But if I amped, then where will I be? What in blazes? What? Heavens! Who was that? I don't know. Not us. But by God, I'm near death of fright. Earl, don't listen out the window. Don't set a light. Don't let nothing see ya. Did that scream sound like Miss Corey? No, I'm right here. Sally, you there? Nah, she's here. Who's closest to the Glen? Think. Mrs. Fry? Prudence? Are you there? Oh, God. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> Ma'am. Walk it.
I shall have to learn all the angles of the planes and all the formulas between the ear and the nunger. They from outside will help, but cannot take body without human blood. Uh, no! Grace of God, how can such as this ever be? This is tragic. You should stay in the car, Henry. Keep an eye on it. We'll look. My ego doesn't need an excuse to look after my flagging body, Rice, but I do thank you. I'll, I'll go make myself comfortable. Is he all right? I don't think he slept well. I don't think anyone did. Not with that call. That smell. That's just like at Wizard Waitley's. Is there any sign of the family? Did any of them get out before the house was crushed? I, I doubt it. Yet... They tried to warn the rest of us. At least with that black uh, residue, I don't see any blood. Till now, it's kept itself to cattle. After this, mark me well, we'll have the taste for folks, too. That upstairs looks like it will have the right cast. I can see it a little when I make the Vurish sign, or blow the powder of Ibn Ghazi at it. And it is near like them at May Eve on the hill. The other face may wear off some. It's all gone. Crushed and mangled and covered in this tarry deposit. I got a bit of a sample, though I'll tell you, I'll never touch this bottle and box again. But leave it to Armitage. I'm, he's fallen asleep. Let him rest. No. This looks bad. Here, put this in the back. During his fever, Armitage would shout that the world was in danger. At other times, he would call for the dreaded Necronomicon and the demon of the tree of Remigius, in which he seemed hopeful of finding some formula to check the peril he conjured up. Armitage. Armitage! <laughs> Damn it. We need to find a place to lie him down and some cold water. <laughs> what is it, man? I can't hear. I'm not dying yet. You keep that in mind. Hold tight and we'll get you comfortable. There are no whippoorwills. For once, being too human may be of some use. Must follow Grandsire's last words. Find the rank in camp before the time comes. Make a visit to town. Something that upstairs could never do. Right cast it no. Thus endeth part two of the Dunwich Horror. From the classic story by H.P. Lovecraft, adapted by Julie Hoverson. In the Dunwich Horror, Professor Henry Armitage was Dave Marshall. Professor Warren Rice was Glenn Hallstrom. Dr. Francis Morgan was Lothar Tuppen. The voice of the Necronomicon is Lord Bloodraw. Wilbur Waitley was Danner Hoverson. Wizard Waitley is Charles Austin... Lavinia Waitley is Julie Hoverson. Miss Ward is Elise Krawick. Mrs. Armitage is Chris Kepler. Dr. Hartwell is Chris Lackey of the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. Curtis Waitley is J. Spider Isaacson. Mamie Bishop is Beverly Poole. Earl Sawyer was Rick Lewis. Silas Bishop is Eli Nilsson. Joe Osborne is Renaud LaBeouf. Mrs. Corey is Robin Keyes. Mrs. Fry is Kimberly Poole of Warped Space. Luther Corey is Matthias Rebney Morgan. Widow Zebulon is Reese T.M. Sally Bishop is Gwendolyn Jensen Woodard of Gypsy Audio. Chauncey Bishop is Mike Campbell. Officer Williams is Jack Kincaid of Edict Zero and Slipgate Nine Productions. Officer O'Reilly is Michael Coleman of Tales of the Extraordinary. The other police officer is Chad Pfeiffer of the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. Seth Bishop and additional voices by Mark Olson and the Dunwich Townsfolk. Music for the Dunwich Horror is by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. The cover art is by Julie Hoverson. The ferocious guard dogs Quinn and Spencer Dutkowski appeared courtesy of their personal sound engineer, Donna. Additional effects by Henry Howard. No whippoorwills, alive or dead, were harmed in the making of this show. 
Much thanks to Fred Greenhog of Radio Drama Revival. Sound and mastering was done by Julie Hoverson. Sound effects were found at soundsnap.com, sonomic.com, and onesoundfx.com. All persons, places, and events in this story were fictitious or used in a fictitious manner and are not meant to reflect any persons, places, or things living, dead, undead, or outside our three-dimensional realm. Questions? Comments? We would love to hear from you. Contact us at 19 Nocturne at turn at live.com. That's 19 Nocturne. Or visit our website at www.19NocturneBoulevard.com. This presentation is copyright 2011 to Julie Hoverson and Reality Productions and is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial license. Spread the show around, but don't try to make money off it. This Halloween... A man wakes in the hospital, and he may never leave again. This hospital is no interest in making you better. <laughs> Final Room Productions and Oral Stage Studios present Intensive Care by James Comtois. <laughs> Those two nurses set you up. They're not being up front with you. You know that, right? <laughs> right? Recorded on location and delivered to your imagination. Tune in October 31st on transcontinentalterror.com, vinylrune.com, or oralstage.com. And beware. Hmm. Why haven't you figured it out by now? Guess they haven't told you why you're here to suffer. Mmm, great coffee. Mmm. Hey. Chad, who's that strange, somber man on the cover of that book you're reading? Oh, that's H.P. Lovecraft. Oh, I've heard of him, but I never really got into his stuff. It's kind of strange and hard to read. No, I used to think that, too. But that all changed when I started listening to the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. What's that? The H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast is a weekly podcast. Tell me more. Well, these two really smart and hilarious guys give a synopsis of the story, then they talk about its background, the critical views, and what it says about the author. Well, where can I listen? Let me tell you, Chris, you can go to hppodcraft.com or, heck, just subscribe through iTunes. It's that easy. Oh, Chad, I'm so excited. Now I can listen to this podcast and pretend to all my snooty friends that I actually read and understand H.P. Lovecraft. Hey, that's what I do. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> 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 <laughs>